So Nazarin, welcome to Director's Notes. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. Good. And we're here to talk about your devastating short is the only word I've sort of got for it. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the film and why you wanted to talk about the sort of encroaching reproductive rights in the US? Well, you know, you can see I'm a woman. <laughs> And so this is an issue that predominantly affects women, but I have to say that it's not exclusively uh, affecting us because of the way you may identify. Uh, important to make that point. But yeah, here I am. And I, when I was in the UK, I'm the mother of two young daughters. Uh, when I was uh, pregnant for the third time, the pregnancy was not viable. And I ended up needing this procedure, which actually ended up becoming an eight hour life uh, saving uh, procedure. Um, having that and having it save my life in order to be around for my two young daughters at the time who are now, you know, older and living with me in America and understanding that this is the legacy they are set to inherit. And even though we live in California and we're not necessarily hugely at risk of that, we don't know what our circumstances are going to be. And also it felt like it behooves me to write for the people across this nation who cannot tell their stories for themselves to just really represent them on the screen, but not in a preachy or didactic way, just to tell a story in a slice of life kind of way about one family who might be undergoing a, uh, a situation in which it's so necessary and the obstacles that have been placed in their way in the aftermath of the Supreme Court's decision to reverse Roe v. Wade back in 2022. Yeah, and I think that's important, sort of the narrative aspect of it. And that was something I loved. There was no, there's no judgment. There's no criticism in your film. It's, it's just, it's kind of matter of fact. And it's what this young woman is having to go through and the steps that she's having to take. And that was something that I really took away from it. I really appreciate you saying that because I think there are um, two, two ways in which we were trying to apply that non-judgmental nature of the storytelling that we aspired to do. And that is with our characters and for all the reasons that someone might want or need this procedure, uh, which are valid. And, you know, our story obviously takes a turn that I won't go into because I want- No spoilers. Yeah, I want our audience to kind of live it and feel it. And that's what's been happening. But also a non-judgmental nature in terms of us as artists and filmmakers who are telling story and using this medium to just bring an audience who might otherwise dismiss these characters in their real lives. But through storytelling, you know, if you can walk a mile in someone's shoes and if we as filmmakers and storytellers can somehow engage in this intangible element of empathy through our work, then maybe we open some eyes and some hearts and minds and then crack open a conversation that has to be had, but in this very non-judgmental way uh, that is conflict-free and that is just about evolving our points of view in any which direction that goes. Yeah. And, he, you know, again, you've done a beautiful job of that because it is very easy. You know, we've all got our own opinions. We've all got our own points of view. But when you're watching something like this and film, you know, I'm a big believer in the vehicle of film to, as you said, open up conversations and to get people to look at things and go, wow, yeah, never thought about it from that point of view. Which they have. I mean, that's been the such a, 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 a joy, really. Uh, to see this resounding impact that it's been ha having across the board. I, I don't know if you've um, been following it at all, but we have posted even on our socials about people saying, oh, like, you know, I was being very judgmental until I realized what the story was. And then it caused me to reevaluate everything I was thinking. And that's all we want you to do. I mean, you know, I'm sure there are going to be people who, uh, have a strong vis visceral reaction to it, both in a positive way and for all I know, in a negative way, depending on what their uh, personal belief systems are. But our view is, please just watch the film and afterwards, maybe 
engage with us then about what you're feeling and what you're not feeling, uh, because, you know, you don't want to be talking about news without reading the news, right? You don't want to be talking about a film that deals with this uh, issue without watching the film. And so we welcome the conversation. We welcome the debate. Um, but yeah, like Brittany, I think I also said, it's like, come speak to us afterwards, but please yeah. watch it. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So one of the things, I mean, we're talking about this non-judgmental side, but I love, so the title, Red, White and Blue. So, you know, an America, it's land, the free land of the greats, all of these ideas that we have in our head. And for me, that title is sort of evoking these freedoms, but then the topic of the film isn't. So what was the choice behind that? Well, you know, do you know Langston Hughes' poem, uh, Let America Be America Again? It's a phenomenal poem. And I think it speaks to this idea of everything America aspires to be, everything that America can be, and the ideals that it is built upon that we ourselves fall down uh, on. And red, white, and blue, therefore, was this allusion to the banner and the flag that we all live under. And I wanted to utilize that to show how it affects all of us. This is not just a conversation to be had uh, for people with reproductive rights in the sense of this is something that affects us predominantly, but actually everyone's involved. You know, we need those allies, people in power, even if you don't have reproductive rights per se, you are voting in such a way that it affects us. So this is just a national conversation as well as a conversation that needs to be had uh, around our dinner tables. And then the red, white and blue of it all is just coming back to saying, look, this is this is a great nation we could be if we only allowed ourselves to see, uh, you know, the every person who might need to be seen, but is actually invisible to us. And um, yeah, and then there were other things that like I wanted to do with it, like image systems I had in my mind with, you know, really opening, even in the script, you'll see it, we're opening on the two lines of, the two red bars of the pregnancy kit and then evolving into kind of, I really believe in a beginning, middle and end and structure. And just because it's a short film, I as a storyteller want to tell a story that feels like it has that beginning, middle and end and character arcs. I feel like our film, if I may say so, stands, you know, every bit in the same space as a longer feature film in that respect. And it was an aspiration to try and do a, uh, tell a story that had that same profound impact and depth of a uh, longer feature film. I always say like, you know, a 90 minute feature film, that same profound impact, but told in 20 odd minutes, but only feels like five minutes in the watching because of its transportive nature. And so, yeah, going back to the image systems of it all, you know, from those two red bars of the pregnancy that propelling us forward to the road trip and the bright daylight, the bright white daylight of it all, the joyous lights of a carousel scene that we have in there into the sterile blue of the clinic and so on. There were just lots of ways in which those themes and actually, you know, which I won't go into here, but what I would urge anyone to go and look up uh, what the red and the white and the blue in the American flag stands for, because it's all to do with these American ideals that we aspire to, but we have yet to fully live up to. I'm going to look them up afterwards. <laughs> so, I mean, talking more about the, the the film itself and the structure, I love, as you said, that you've got that whole world in there. Um, so I read that when you were writing, it was very instinctive, the story flowed. So then working into the three parts, how was the editing process and building that flow? So one of the things that I have to say is I had amazing cast and crew and I was able to protect the vision that was on the page in every single aspect of the filmmaking. So, you know, I wrote that very quickly, like I said, two or three hours, it was fully formed in my head and um, it's probably the fastest I've ever written a script. And then, you know, we went into production and we adjusted for practical considerations. And then there's a few things that you find as a filmmaker that you want to do that are additive. And so you find those uh, in the shoot itself. And then you're asking about editing. I have a brilliant, brilliant editor, 
Philip, uh, Jay McLaughlin, he, um, he and I worked together on Fear the Walking Dead. And I think he is just, I told him this and he said that he was going to get it printed and on his business card. But I said, he's a writer's and director's dream. And he really is. He is someone who intuitively um, understood this story. And it's important to say, one of the things that we did was actually brought Bill into the conversation early. We have a aspect ratio shift that happens, an idea that my director of photography came up with, although the placement of that is something uh, that was very much informed by uh, when he pitched the idea to me about where it needed to be, that I kind of put it into a different place for very important story reasons. But we brought Phil in very early into our discussions because we knew that we wanted to edit this in a way that it kept the purity of the script um, as it had been kept in production through into editing. So that doesn't happen often. You know, editors come into the process afterwards. And, you know, we had a couple of conversations. And so Phil knew what we were doing and we were getting ideas from him about what would help him in the edit afterwards. Uh, so that was a conversation prior to filming. Like I said, it's very unusual to do that. But I do think it's actually an excellent way of working. And it meant that when we got into the editing suite afterwards, he had had those conversations, been part of prep, understood really what the goal was so that he could get in and make his um, initial cut close to what I needed to be so there was less work to do. Although that said, we then really fine-tuned it. It's the process was fast because we were trying to submit it to fe film festivals. But because he gave me a generosity of time, like so many people did, we were able to really just work through it um, uh, intensively and get it done. But uh, yeah, it was just such a joy to work with him and to know that people really understood my vision at the outset. And it wasn't something I was having to explain after the fact. I could explain it before the fact. Yeah. I mean, it, the, the, it, the pacing of it is just perfect. It really is. Well, can I tell you something? So I wrote this, you know, there's that page per minute rule. It's like yeah. 10 and a half pages on the script. And of course I knew it was going to grow because of the fact that uh, there's a road trip in there and you put these kind of montage scenes in there and you know, this is going to take up time on the screen. So maybe you're adding five minutes on, but then when we got to it, you know, Phil and I, it was like, the first cut he delivered to me, I think the final time now is 22 and a half minutes running time. And, you know, in my head before I started there, I was like, oh, this is going to be around 15 minutes maybe. But then, you know, you get into it and you understand the realities of what you need to do. And that pacing, I'm so glad that you feel that it is worthy of that time frame of 22 minutes versus the 15 minutes I had, you know, assumed naively right at the start of this. <laughs> Uh, it's worth it because when he delivered that cut to me, I think we just both understood that we needed to let it breathe and we needed to live with these characters. And by the way, where the story's going, if we don't have those moments, I feel like we actually end up losing the emotional punch of the story that's coming. We need to really live and feel like we're either a fly on the wall of the these characters in their world but if I've done my job we're actually more than that we're like right there with them in their home as a family member as if they have just given us a you know a peek behind the curtains of their world and so on and so to really understand that and feel that you couldn't race this story and I was you know there's film festivals that we didn't end up getting into or being even able to submit to I should say because we were over the 20 minute mark it's and a tricky one. It's so tricky, but you know what? To me, story is king or queen. I have to always say queen. Um, I even though I know we no longer have a queen, we have a king. Uh, but I yes, I still time. have a story. <laughs> um, and I say we. I'm actually in. <laughs> You're there like, in sunny California. <laughs> yeah, and there's no monarchy here. Although you know <laughs> it's Hollywood, so there's monarchy of a different kind. Story is king, story is queen. And so you cannot, um, I couldn't let that influence what I had to do. I'm not going to try and make my film into something to fit something else. It has to be dictated by what does this story deserve? What does an audience deserve in terms of uh, going on this journey with us and us delivering the impact in the way that we need to deliver it? And, you know, 
if we were to make this shorter, I really do believe we would lose lose the emotional impact that uh, I hope is delivered upon you know our audience. Yeah, that makes total sense because there are you know and lots of people prescribe to different rules as to length. But one of the things as well in the film is you've got just beautiful little nuggets of information everywhere that we pick up that really flesh out the story and enable us to sort of, yes, to walk in her shoes. And we understand her poverty. We understand her cars impounded. We understand, you know, the minutiae is saving dollars. So I think you don't want to rush that. You don't want to rush that. And that is all intentional. And look, she's a mom who works hard. Yes, she's living from pay to check to paycheck. And yes, she is in a socioeconomic class where they don't have as much. But she's a good mom. You can see it in the bedroom decor, right? She is. And by the way, it doesn't, you don't have to have wealth, right, to be a good mom. Mm -hmm. And one might argue that those moms are doing the hardest job in the world and should be applauded for it. But she's made that environment into a very family environment for her kids. You know, you go into the uh, bedroom, there's those fairy lights and so on. And the comfort of the home that she's providing and she's doing her best, the best that she can, right? And maybe they're going to be fine. Maybe they're going to get by. But for the fact that this thing happens and then most Americans, you know, I think it probably applies to Britain too and almost anywhere in the world that the a much larger percentage of the population unfortunately does not have enough of a rainy day fund. So if something happens, even like two to $300 worth that is required of their pocket as an unexpected expense, it can really throw someone into a whole spiral of just um, not being able to get out of a hole that ha they have not necessarily dug themselves into but that has been dug for them. Yeah. No, those those kind of things can be life altering. Yeah. You, so talking about, you know, this world that you fleshed out and those fairy lights and everything. One thing I was really impressed by, because obviously we all know shorts, is your locations, the world that you built, the production design. It's all amazing. And it really feeds into the Thank story. you. Was that a I challenge? Yes, because of the limited amount of resources we had, it was an absolute challenge. And I love that you're calling these things out because one thing, if you're looking at our socials or anything like that, what I personally have really tried to do is champion the cast and crew that came on board and did so much to help me tell this story. It was challenging in terms of the schedule, the resources that we had, but the credit goes to you know, everybody who worked on this, Emma Co, our production designer, locations, you know, Neil Napier, Hector Tinoco, and they, everyone just brought their all to it. And so I think it speaks to the level of uh, craft that we had on this film and the quality of filmmaking and the fact that we had real artists on this. I mean, I, I think I was lucky to have certain relationships. I didn't know everybody who joined my crew, but I knew some of them, like my director of photography, Adam Sujitsky, who is a Brit like me, who flew over. He and I worked together oh. on Fear the Walking Dead. And actually, when I first reached out to him in August, he was shooting the Orphan Black prequel series. And I was like, I'm doing this thing. Oh my goodness, I wish I could do it, like whatever. And I actually... You know, I thought about moving on without him, but I could not think about actually doing it without him. And as it turned out, maybe I would have had to, but as it turned out, you know how hard it is to put any kind of film out there, let alone a short film with this level of, you know, high production values is like even more difficult. So things get delayed a little bit. And that delay worked in my favor because I reached out to him again on, uh, you know, just on an instinct of like, let, let me just ask again, nothing ventured, nothing gained in November. And he said, as it happens, I'm gonna be finishing up in December. It might be January. I really wanna do this with you. Um, and he basically made it happen after he read the script. So um, he's, he's a brilliant, brilliant cinematography. Just have to go and look at his credits and his cinematic genes. He's the third generation DP. So he's brilliant. 
production designer, Emma Coe. I did not know her before this. She was brilliant. Neil Napier, who is one of the locations team, actually is an actor. He plays the diner owner. And okay. he and I had never met. And uh, but basically we had a credit in common. I worked on a show called Blood and Treasure that he had starred in. He had a mini arc in that. And so when we got on a Zoom to um, talk about location, he was, he was like, uh, Nazarin, I, I started in this thing. So it's really nice to meet you uh, finally. And I'm like, <laughs> you're doing locations for us. And he was brilliant. He has this uh, bike and his iPhone and he has such a cinematic eye. I, like, I really want to, I know we don't have so much time for our interview or conversation, but it's, it's so nice that you're bringing up these departments so I can speak about all of these people who are just star players who brought their A game. And and that's what makes a film. I mean, there's 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 every little different element. It's it's the writing, it's the production, it's the cameras, it's the shooting, it's it's all of these things that come together. And it really is build the world for the audience, because that's ultimately what it is. It really is. And I think, you know, um nobody pays attention, right, to the credits when they roll. Oh, um, I always stay. Apart from the people who really care about it. Um, and I would like urge everyone to look at the credits for our filmmakers who contributed to this because, you know, each one of them did play a significant role and it takes a village. And to me, I feel like the best filmmaking is when you can't see the craft behind it, right? So you're not looking for the cinematography. You're not listening to the score per se. You're taking it all in as a piece. Hopefully, if we've done our job well, you're not really looking for the production design on that first watch, mm. unless you're like a writer like me. Like I, I'm an annoying person to watch <laughs> TV and film with because I'm like, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to go here. And if I was, writer, I would do this. Or, yeah, this is what they're going to do. I see it coming. So I'm really annoying to be around because I can I can talk about it in the way that um, probably robs other people of their purity because my brain is just wired to do that. But there are instances in which, you know, even I, as someone who's a writer, can stop thinking about the writing if someone's done their job well. And it's only on the second watch or the third watch that because you're looking for it, you go back and see the skill to the cinematography or the precise nature of the production design or the props. You know, like our production designer was also a props master because it's a short film. <laughs> and like all the little details that she thought through or the locations and how you know, you, because we had to film with a local crew because of budgetary constraints, we would have loved to kind of have taken this all the way out to Arkansas, but the crew were all here and, uh, you know, had homes that they could leave every day to come and do yeah. this. And so like credit again, like to our locations department for figuring out and finding places that allowed us to make it feel like the world that we were in as well as they did. Yeah, no, that that's wonderful. And it's so nice also to hear a director talking about all those different elements. Because like you said, it takes a village, you know, to bring it that really world does. to life. I mean, yeah, because they are ultimately working to your vision. Of course, you have to make mm -hmm. ch decisions and choices and so on. But one of the things that I really wanted to do, and I hope this is why our film is now um, Oscar nominated, is to also allow artists to bring their best selves to this, to bring all their ideas, to respect them and to value that they had a point of view on something based off of my script. And then I could talk to them about it and what felt right and what didn't. It's like, yeah, that's great, amazing, go do it. Or like, okay, well, this doesn't work for this reason, but here's my, here's my thought process behind it, both as a writer and the story point of view of it all, but also as a director and what I'm looking for on the screen. And then for them to then go away and then bring me their ideas based on that. It's always a conversation. It's never a demand. Yes, you do have to make decisions, but it's really important to empower the filmmakers that you brought in and respect that they know what they're doing in their field better than you do. Yeah. Yeah, no, that that's such a huge part of it. Nobody, nobody knows everything, and yeah, to respect other people's craft. Yeah. I wanted to talk a bit of, so about the cinematography. It's obviously we're focusing on this young woman and everything she's going through, and you managed to centralize her whilst talking about the whole story. Does that make sense? And 
I just I just noticed that really poignantly. Yeah, that was always very deliberate. You know, I really wanted a stillness to this. And Adam and I talked about that from the outset. And um, we were both on the same page about that, about, look, this is about showing and not telling. And let our very smart and capable audience understand and read things from the visual cues that are there. And we really wanted to lean into that whole cinematic storytelling style. You know, I've worked extensively in TV and it's very dialogue driven. Um, not exclusively, but there is much more dialogue. And I really wanted to move away from that because I started in film, transitioned into TV. So this was a return to film in the director's chair. And I really wanted to lean into just this muscular storytelling of where we are holding on um, Brittany Snow, who um, really is just a magnificent performer. And she has those eyes that can, that can convey so much. Mm. Um, why would you not want to hold it on her? And yeah. why wouldn't you want, you know, the frames to be still so that basically your eye is completely always with the characters, even as we're populating those scenes with the little details that are captured of, you know, the cracked piggy bank in a scene or whatever we're doing, those details are there. Or, you know, that I uh, like what has become for me the um, the poster image of uh, our film with that flag behind her, which is credit to um, our production designer, Emma, for so strategically placing it there and a credit to Adam for so beautifully picking up that shot that gave us that image. Like you look at that photo of her and you see the emotion even come through from a poster, never mind the film, I hope. And so yeah, it's just about letting the story breathe and letting the story just not feel like it's frantic in any way and allowing the stillness to be a juxtaposition against the frantic inner turmoil of a character who is, you know, an ordinary American facing extraordinary circumstances. Yeah, I mean, that's a beautiful, it's a beautiful way to put it. So, I mean, we, you've touched on it a bit, but your Oscar nomination, I mean, congratulations. Thank you so much. I mean, yeah, it's like, it's two days old, but I don't know if it will ever get old because I can't believe it. I, I really can't believe it. We knew we had a film that we believed in and we were telling it not to necessarily gain an Oscar nomination, but because we had to tell this story. Yeah. But the fact that then the Academy sees us and recognizes us in I think it was 187 qualified films this year and like we're in the top five like with filmmakers that are heavy hitters and here I am it's like <laughs> thank you for seeing me it's like it's such a privilege and an honor to be recognized in this way and I know our entire cast and crew also feels that way and just to say our very dedicated and passionate audience is so rooting for us like they, they are constantly championing us. So it felt rewarding to get this just to kind of have them feel like they could celebrate and that this was their nomination too. Yeah. And this, you know, the, the theme and the topic of the film is something that we need to see more and we need to get excited about and we need to have voices. And I think that nomination is just going to further that. Thank you. I, I hope so too, because that is the biggest gift that it has given us and will continue to give us is Academy members recognizing the artistry in it, um, which I think is tied into, they're not just looking at the artistry, I'm sure, and I hope they are feeling the impact of the story and what we set out to do. And the knock-on effect it's having on them is actually maybe reflective of the knock-on effect it's having on a wider audience that doesn't belong to the filmmaking community. Um, so yeah, we're just, we're just really thrilled to have been seen by them. And what about you? Are you going to continue with film now? Well, you know, I'm a writer, so I never escape that because <laughs> if I, you know, this story I had to write because it was uh, eating me up alive. And I have to say this actually as well, just so I don't forget to say it. A lot of people talk about this being a timely story, but actually, you know, speaking to the importance of telling these stories, we tell these stories and they have a timely nature, but sadly, 
they feel like stories that are timeless because we seem to keep having the need to tell this story and reminding people about issues of reproductive rights and bodily autonomy. In our case, we just want to tell it in uh, the most characterful way possible without hitting people over the head. Just a pure story about what it looks like uh, for a character like Rachel Johnson and her family and so on. For me personally, in terms of the directing of it all, um, yeah, I mean, like, I I have features that I've written that I have thought about directing, you know, and maybe one of those features becomes my next project or I start to think about what else uh, this could be because I wrote it as a proof of concept that, well, actually, no, I wrote it as a story and a film that could live in its own right and uh, be a piece of art that just is complete. But there is a bigger story to tell here. You know, it's important to say that as much as we're featuring the characters in this story, historically, women of color, uh, people who have uh, historically had uh, an assault on their reproductive rights and ability to get uh, health care, Roe v. Wade was not necessarily something new to them in terms of the obstacles that they were facing. And so to tell that larger story of, you know, many people who might need this procedure for some reason, but again, always in a story way, because we're really interested in the humanity of these characters. This isn't just a subject led um, film. It's really about human beings. It's really about us seeing one another and understanding who is there that is powerless to speak up for themselves or to act for themselves and how those of us in power can level that out by becoming the allies that we need to become. Um, yeah, and in an important election year, you know, as I see um, reports of how many, how many people are affected by this in, in such tragic stories coming out of this, um, just mindful of the fact that it's timely but I don't know that we ever need to stop telling this story and reminding people how important it is to have self-determination yeah. and human dignity. I, I, I mean, I, I concur. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much. I really appreciate this. It's, um, it's really nice to talk about just the art and craft of filmmaking, as well as why, you know, this was, um, this was something I had to do. Like, it was eating me up alive uh, when I was listening to the news. And so I had to get it out of my system by writing this film and then putting it out there. And yeah, of course now, you know, I've loaded myself up with the fact that uh, you get bitten by a certain bug and think, oh, now I have to do more. And so <laughs> yeah, I'm, the sleeplessness and uh, the long nights are gonna continue, not just because of the Academy campaign, but because of the fact that I've just added director to the many things that I feel like I need to do just because uh, I feel compelled to do it now. I mean, you have a very powerful voice. So I Thank very you. much urge you to continue. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's really meaningful for me that you uh, responded to our film and all the kind and generous words you had to say about it. And uh, the fact that you helped shine a light on some of our incredible cast and crew, please do go and check out the credits because this is my way of giving a shout out to them all.